Reading from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 19. Give you all a chance to find it. And I'll read. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of, who, of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Mm. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Amen. All right, after you. Okay, if you guys need a Bible, um, last week, you know, Howie on the spot, we mentioned that we were going to get some large print Bibles, so if anyone needs a large print Bible, uh, there's a couple scattered here. There's two left uh, if you should want one. All right, so that's yours. Um, and let's get into this. Parable of the Talents is where we're going to be today. Um, let me just kind of ground us in where we've been as a church in this season is we're trying to honestly be clear about who we are, uh, hope to be, how we want to live. And so we're calling this series uh, PCC, period. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can say, but what we want to be able to really lay out is uh, the vision of our church, where we want to go, uh, the mission of our church, uh, what we exist to be and do every day in order to realize that vision, and then how we want to live, what we're calling our uh, core virtues. Oftentimes people call them uh, core values. Um, I like virtues. It's an ancient word um, that essentially means something similar to like core values. However, it connects it far more uh, to the character and nature of whatever the transcendent thing was. Uh, we call that transcendent being God. And so these values arise out of God's very, very being, hence the word uh, virtues. And I think that one of the things I want to be able to say is uh, here are our core virtues, and we're going to go through them over the next uh, few weeks. We're actually going to start in reverse order. We're going to be here, and then we're going to go here and there. Um, but oftentimes when we think about uh, values, we, we, we think of, of one thing, and then we think of another thing, and we think of another thing. Um, I, because I see these arising out of the character and nature of God, what I see our, our core virtues as, I see them as tensions. I see them as holding two things oftentimes that people might want to pit against each other or, or say are separate. And I want to say, no, as a community, as we march forward, we want to be able to hold these things together. We want to hold together uh, health and growth, a concern for both. We want to hold together openness as a community, but also critique as a community. And we want to hold together a high regard for uh, the text of Scripture, but also a high regard for the context in which we all live. Uh, and so in many ways, these are tensions, the both and, because they arise out of the character and nature. Oop, uh, oh, you could barely see it. They arise out of the character and nature of the God we serve and reflect, who he himself is a tension. He is one, and yet he's more than one. Uh, he's unity and he's diversity. And so if this world is meant to reflect something of God, uh, we should experience this world in tension as well. Not an either or, but a both and. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to lay out some of the both ands um, through our core virtues. And this week, as I said, we're going to be addressing the issue of uh, health versus growth. What does it mean for us to have a high, value of, uh, high view of both? To esteem... Uh, being a, a community of health, but also a community of growth. Um, and really, if you put those together, oftentimes throughout the ages, people have used uh, the language of flourishing. So what does it mean for us to be a community that flourishes? 
Um, And today what we have through Jesus' famous parable of the talents in Matthew 25 is that God's, uh, his people's flourishing, so PCC's flourishing relies on God's character and posture and what we assume about them. So I want to say that our health and our growth, our flourishing, relies on God's character and his posture and what we actually assume about them. All right. So let's see what Matthew 25 has for us. Let's seek the Lord in prayer and then let's get into the text. Join me. Father, um, would you please help us to hold together uh, these tensions over these next few weeks? Uh, but specifically today, help us to not retreat into the either or. Help us to not do the, well, I'm on this side, or I'm totally on this side, but help us to to hold both of these things together, uh, not just for the sake of wanting to be different, um, but for the sake of wanting us to reflect your character, uh, your nature, your being as a God who has uh, revealed himself in Father, Son, and Spirit, Lord. We appeal to you the original and ultimate tension. Uh, Make yourself clear to us Uh, through the word, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Uh, Bethany, noon is the answer to the question to the text you sent me. Um, Real-time texting from Bethany going on right now. Uh, Okay, we're going to start in Matthew 25, all right? And I said that PCC's flourishing uh, relies on God's character and posture. And in fact, I want to accentuate that a little bit more. Um, It doesn't just rely there, it starts there. Our flourishing, our idea of flourishing, what it means for us to flourish as a healthy community, as a growing community, uh, it actually starts with God. Um, I want your eyes to, to pop down to verse 14 there where it says, it will be like a man going on a journey. The it is, the it is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, uh, so Jesus is doing all of these kingdom parables, and what, what, it, what these kingdom parables are is trying to elucidate or flesh out what it actually means to be the people of God here on earth. And so when you hear kingdom of heaven, don't hear heaven, or don't assume heaven. In fact, hear that old Belinda Carlisle song, uh, if you know it, right? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. That's actually how the theology of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven works, Right? It is a place on earth. Flourishing uh, is about how we live out certain virtues and values on earth to reflect what heaven would look like if it were here. Because one day it will be. And as I said, flourishing starts with God and something specific about God. If you notice in verses 14 through 15, it says... Um, It'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So the man on this journey is God. He's not a helicopter parent. He's not a micromanager. He is entrusting certain things to his people, the language of servants. And and just so you know, I'm not going to get into this too much. That's an Israelite term. So he's entrusting to his people Israel, whatever that means and whoever that represents, He's entrusting to them a calling, and he's giving them certain things. What is he giving them? It says in verse 15, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Um, If you hear that, um, talents is not what we think of as talents. Uh, The better way of thinking about talents is really a, a, a life's worth of resources. So God's given to people, his people, everything they needed to flourish in life. And within the context of Israel's history, it was God gave them land, God gave them law, and there's a third L, God gave them leaders. So God entrusted to them everything you needed to be a healthy community. He gave them land, a place to exist, Uh, a law, a way to live equitably in this world and create a flourishing society for themselves and others, and then leaders to be able to steward that process. And so at this point, 
I want you to start to let the thoughts in your brain kind of percolate. What has God entrusted to us? How has he entrusted things for our lifelong flourishing? And I ask you to start cataloging that because um, we have a difficult time thinking that our stuff isn't our stuff. Right? Um, if, if you're wondering what has God entrusted to us, start thinking about uh, what it is you think you own or what it is you think you have and maybe what it is that you fear losing the most. And realize that all that we have, all that we own, is something we've been entrusted with. And that could be expertise, it could be experiences, it could be resources, capital, uh, people, access, opportunities. If I look across this room, I'm seeing people that have operated in the for-profit world, the non-profit world, ministry, marketplace, suburban, urban, all of these spaces that we've occupied, in some ways far more far-reaching than Jesus' first century hearers. Because where they were is where they were, and it's where they stayed. Wasn't a lot of mobility in that day and age. And so in many ways, uh, we we might say 21st century talents, resources we've been given for lifelong flourishing, far outpaces what even they had in the first century. And so the question then becomes, for them and for us, what is the appropriate response that we're supposed to have to this God who entrusts? What's the, response that, what's, what's the response that we're supposed to have? How are we supposed to handle all that he's given us? And in the text now, we have to consider, well, what did these servants do with the talents that were given to them, with the resources that were entrusted to them? And as you look at verses, really for the rest of uh, the text today, from verses 16 to 23, and specifically, um, I want you to look, starting in verse 16, It says to this servant, specifically the one that received five talents, it says he received, traded, and made five talents more. Right? He received, he traded, and made five talents more. In a word, he multiplied them. So what you're hearing already is growth. Right? So, so, so this servant, and then the one behind him, right, this servant that got uh, two talents, he did the same thing. He made more. So he was given something, and he made more. He multiplied with it. And so if you're thinking about this health growth dichotomy right now, growth seems to be something that is prioritized here. So I guess growth has the day. And so I guess as a church, like one option is, and there's a lot of churches that believe this, A lot of churches all of a sudden think, okay, we read it here, and so let's break out uh, the smoke machines, and let's break out the dry ice and the blue lights, right? And let's let's get to a place where, uh, not this, where that's where our services start to look like, and that's what growth means, and that's what God calls us to. Um, Maybe that's you, and maybe it's the call to be fruitful, and that's what fruitfulness looks like for you. But I think in in some of us, maybe some of us are like, yes, that is what I want. When's PCC? When are we doing that? Um, But I think there's some of us who who do the opposite, which is like, I think God's not calling us to that. I think he's calling us to be be this, this pure remnant, to be not fruitful, but faithful. And so not only do you get this health growth dichotomy, you get this... Uh, um, better to be faithful than fruitful dichotomy. And so we have to pick this either or that happens here. Right? Have you guys ever heard that language? We may not be fruitful, but our goal is to be faithful. Right? We've heard that. Here's the issue with that. Look in verses 21 and 23. How does it describe the servants who multiplied, the ones who traded and made more? How does it describe them? Notice the language in verses 21 and 23. It says, his master said to him, the one who multiplied, well done, good and faithful servant. And he says it again. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. And he says that again in verse 23 to the, to the servant who got two and made two more. He said, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. 
And so multiplying this multiplication mindset, this, this fruitful mindset is not at cross purposes with a faithful mindset. In fact, if you actually want to carve it out through Scripture, you can tell the whole story of the Bible through this theme of faithfulness versus fruitfulness. And you realize that the left side of the Bible, this would be the Hebrew Bible, this would be the story of Israel and the Old Covenant, the kind of fading signal in black. The story of Israel and the Old Covenant is they were faithless to the covenant. And then if you track all the imagery in the Hebrew Bible, you'll realize that they start as this, this garden, and they're given this land, and then all, it, all of a sudden the language turns into, well, they're not a garden, they're a smaller vineyard. And then eventually they're not a small vineyard anymore, they're a tree. And eventually you realize that tree has been whittled down to a stump. And so the, the, the theme is, uh, the story is that Israel has, it's not about faithless uh, or fruitless, it's that if those things go together, and similarly, in the new covenant, out of that little stump comes a branch. His name's Jesus. And he creates a people now who are both faithful to the covenant, which means being fruitful in its mission. And so what we're seeing here in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents, and actually what we've seen throughout the whole story of Scripture, is that faithful and fruitful go together. Now, okay, great. You, you've learned that bit of theology how does that flesh itself out? How does that work itself out in our minds, in our psychology, in our mindsets? Um, Caitlin asked me, is Caitlin here? I saw her here before. She's in the nursery. Okay, Caitlin asked me a couple of weeks ago, we met up at Rutgers, and she said, hey, what are like some of the specific goals um, and objectives that we have for PCC? And then she paused and she said, or, is the first thing a mindset shift? And I said, man, you have a lot of wisdom. You're, just, you're not just good at reading Enneagrams, like you have a lot of wisdom. By the way, reading Enneagrams is also wisdom. I'm just saying she has, she's, she's recognizing that, yeah, we need the specific objectives to hold ourselves accountable to and, and, pro, and track growth over time, but if you don't have the mindset shift, then all of that won't work. And so how does this mindset shift work? Well, I want, um, this is, I'm taking a risk right now. Okay, because I'm going to go way geeky on you for a second, and I'm going to talk to you about how I was um, pastored by a rabbi. Okay, let me break this down. I wish Kevin was here because he would be speaking this language. Um, in Wall Street, I think I've told you guys this before, that people who take you under their wing, um, they're your rabbis. They're considered your rabbis. And my rabbi was a guy named Steve Cohen, very good rabbi name. Um, but he pastored me in working out a particular mindset and working in a mindset that actually has a lot to do with the way the Bible talks about faith. So I'm gonna show you the shape of it, and I don't want you to get lost in the weeds. Now, some of you guys are geek, oh, you're gonna geek out, and so, okay, no, not that. This, okay, it's pretty geeky. Um, let me break it down. So one of the things that, young traders in Wall Street realize is they don't have the proper psychology for doing well in, in the markets, for trading and growing, right? Trading, in this passage, there's a particular mindset. And the successful traders, and I don't want you to get lost in everything, the successful traders are the ones that realize, yeah, there's a little bit of pain that you experience on a path towards growth. And you have to be able to experience this pain in order to experience that gain. Right? And it's, you believe in the broader vision. You believe in, in, you have a view. You might call it a world view. You have a view as to how this thing's going to go. And you're willing to put your chips on a table, so to speak. And you know in between, there is going to be bumps along the way. There is going to be pain in the near term. But over the long term, there will be great, great gain. That's a trader. That's a successful trader's mindset. We'll call it the multiplication mindset. But here's the thing. Uh, there is another mindset that Steve Cohen, my rabbi, my, do you not want Roger to see it? No, I want Oh, got it. All right. Now? Okay, cool. Um, so there's another mindset, okay? This is the mindset of the trader that, that, that flourishes. 
The mindset that most people, and it, this is not an issue of intelligence, by the way. This is an issue of, uh, well, we'll get to what it's an issue of in a second, but the other mindset looks like this. And this is what I would call more of a scarcity mindset. And believe it or not, a lot of people come into Wall Street with this mindset, which is, um, I, if I get any gains when I trade, I'm not gonna let those gains run because you never know when the gains are gonna go away. And so if I get a small gain, I'm gonna pull out, I'm gonna pull out, I'm gonna pull out, I'm gonna pull out. Because fundamentally, my view is negative for the long term. I don't trust the resources I have. I don't trust the environment or my read of the environment. And so over, term, uh, over the long term, the best I can hope for are small wins within a worldview, within a mindset that is actually oriented towards long-term losses. But you get so stuck in the weeds and you get so, uh, you zoom in so much that you can't zoom out to see the bigger picture and you can't analyze it well and you can't take advantage of it well. And so the best you can hope for is the little gains. But you lose sight of the fact that you're oriented towards big losses for yourself and others. We'll call this the scarcity mindset. And this isn't just about Steve Cohen training the right mindset into 26, 27-year-old pro Tim. I'm grateful for that, but I'm grateful for that because it's kind of the mindset that we see here between the various servants in this passage. Because what, what the master wants is he wants servants who trust that there is a tailwind, that there is a, a larger optimistic movement optimistic movement at work that they can leverage, that they can lean into, regardless of what the headwinds are in life. And there are real headwinds. There is real pain that we encounter. But how do we maximize the gain rather than always having our eyes on the pain? What are some of the headwinds we face? Right? Um, some of us are, are headwinds. The stuff we face, the stuff that keeps us in a scarcity mindset. Let me just put them both up here so you can see it. The stuff that keeps us on the scarcity mindset on the left can oftentimes be a pain, grief, um, loss. Right? And you can maybe even again, you can clock what that looks like in your life, what it has looked like in your life. And you, can, you probably have a face to this. You probably can date it. You probably, they've become, to use the language of inside out, they've become core memories for you. And where it's brought you to is a place where it's like, mm, it's too hard to try or try again and it's much easier to not, right? So there may be an element of, of pain, of grief, or loss that led us there. It may be, honestly, and this is probably a bit more of a vulnerable place that a lot of us don't admit to, but we may honestly have a gap in our skill or in our knowledge. That's possible. It's possible that, that we learn something some way and, and now there's like something new that's coming in. You don't know how to make sense of both. And you're ultimately just afraid that you're going to somehow get it wrong. Or that you always learned it wrong. And now you don't want to like, you know, put yourself out there and learn something new. Because what if this something you're learning new now in 2044, you find out it's wrong. Right? And some of us struggle with that. So maybe it's a skill or a knowledge gap. I don't want to get it wrong. So again, it's better to not try. Scarcity version number two. And then maybe thirdly, you might just think, ah, it's a personality thing. I'm not this person. I'm not the person on the right. I'm not the risk taker. In fact, I'm quite risk averse, right? I'm not your Jesus version of jobs, right? I'm not, I'm not, there's not an entrepreneurial side. There's not like a you know, uh, I'm not the type that takes a lot of risk in life. I'm, I'm, in fact, quite risk averse. It's not even a category for me. You know, maybe that's a, um, 
Maybe that's a, you know, something that a church planter, someone who has planted churches, like maybe that's a Pastor Mark thing. Or, or maybe, I'll stay within his family, maybe it's a Kevin De- he flips houses and he does all this stuff, and maybe that's a him thing. Or Ming and Tony, you know, they're, they're international missionaries. Maybe, maybe this mindset is just talking about people like that. And I'm not like that, so I shouldn't even try to be like that. Whatever it is, um, I don't think while validating uh, the pain, the grief, the loss, the gaps in skill and knowledge, even the personality differences, I don't think that's ultimately what's beneath our multiplication or scarcity mindsets. I think those are real, but I don't think they're ultimate. So what might be ultimate? And this is where I want us to get to really the crux of the matter of what flourishing looks like. Go to verses 24 to 25. Because there is, very literally, a come-to-Jesus meeting that happens here. A confrontation where the master comes upon the servant and he says, Hey, uh, he also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master... So, so let me just recap real quick. The, the, ta- the servant that had the five talents traded, multiplied five more. The servant that had the two talents made two more. And then there's the one that had the one. He didn't make more. He found a place, put it in a box, stuffed it under his mattress, put it in a safe in his house, buried it in the backyard. Why? Maybe it's the reasons, the headwinds I just mentioned, loss, gaps, personality differences. That's not what ultimately the scriptures will let us land on. Verses 24, it says, verse 24 and 5, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. I dusted it off right back to you, just like you gave it to me. How do you hear this servant? What do, you, do, you, do you think he's ignorant? Do you think he's entitled? I used to think that. I used to look at this passage and it says, I knew you to be a hard man. And I used to think, oh, you, you don't know your master. And that's the problem is that this servant doesn't know his master. Because he says, you reap where you don't sow. You gather where you don't scatter. So, so I know you to be hard. Um, maybe overbearing, and then kind of greedy and kind of unfair. And I used to think, man, the the servant doesn't know the master. That's the problem here. He's entitled. He's ignorant. That's not all I think about this servant. Because I think if we're honest, I think this servant is honest. And I think I can hear my voice in this servant. And I want us to ponder whether or not we've allowed ourselves to confront ourselves with the fact that God does ask a lot of us. And sometimes it feels like God asks too much of us. And it feels like it's it's great for you to ask all that you ask. Could you also give us a dash of omnipotence and a dollop of omniscience and give us all of the resources that you have to be able to handle all that you ask of us. So I hear that in this servant. I hear this servant saying, you only gave me one. Remember, according to my ability. So, so I have less ability and so you gave me this portion of lifelong resources. And I want us to hear his voice in that and, and, and maybe hear the echo of our own, which, which says God does ask a lot. And again, you could probably date the times in which you felt that. And they might be present. But I think what this servant tells us is that God asks a lot of us. And right now I'm thinking about parents who ask a lot of their children But I'm also thinking about the fact that God also gives a lot. 
And I think that that's probably, if I was there, what I would want to say to this servant is, God has asked a lot of you, and it is scary, and it is risky, and you could lose it if that was the period at the end of the sentence. But remember, this is the God that gave you a ta- lifelong resources, Israel. And everything that you have and everything that you own and everything that you fear losing wasn't yours in the first place. Which is a hard thing for us, especially I would say us as Americans to believe that we didn't just acquire everything by our own sweat equity. And in some ways, I think all of us are spring-loaded to see ourselves as self-made men and women. God does ask a lot, but more than that, God does give a lot. And, and, and I think of him as like a parent who, I remember the first time my daughters got on a field or went into a space where we were not, whether it was like a, you know, a play date or whatever, and there was this delight, which is to say like, hey, I want to see you make much of this. Make much of this space. Make much of this time. Make much of this opportunity that you have. And so where does this multiplication versus scarcity come to, come, to, come to four in our lives? Well, let me just give you a couple of places where it might be applicable to us. Think about, and by the way, at this point, get those questions and responses kind of queued up because it's coming, and I would love to hear how this lands because it's so important to our culture here, this particular core virtue of health and growth, multiplication, mindsets. So I think of friends and family. And I think of um, God desires for us to keep a gain multiplication mindset, not just to settle, and I've done this, um, that, oh, we had a good night. And and I've done this with my parents. that That was a peaceful night. Nothing bad happened. And yet, and I'm especially aware of this as I speak to my father, we're about to surprise him with his 80th birthday next week. Um, I'm mindful that I can hear, like, you know, there is a clock in some sense that's ticking in which I want to be able to say, like, I don't want to just rack up a string of, like, oh, like, peaceable nights. Those are great to have, but could there be something more? Could there be a more of a trader's multiplication mindset in that space? Some of us may be with friends, that there is, you, you, you have credibility set up with friends, And maybe there's a need with friends and family for us to just take that next step, a big step, to take a risk and and engage in an area of your friendship that might actually bring about things that have been ignored for a long, long, long time. I think about this with finances. I think the multiplication mindset would be that, hey, listen, I've given you resources. It's not yours, ultimately. Invest in training, equipping, and sending. Hell, even employing the people in this church. And I'm not specifically even primarily talking about me, although it would be great. Um, I'm speaking about seeing the stuff we have, again, the resources we've been given, and not seeing them uh, as things that we're supposed to keep a white-knuckled grip around because we think they're ours till the day we die. And even in our faith, to lean into new skills and and new areas of content, even new areas of advocacy for people, rather than just saying, well, I I already have my pet doctrine set up. I have the people who I consider my people. I have my political stances set up, and I'm done. I'm good. I want to just really call attention to a couple people here who I think are doing this so well in this season. I'm going to call attention to one. Um, Dennis and Donna. Dennis is over here um, to my right. Um, Dennis and Donna have been faithful people to be present here. How long have you guys been here now? Like a year and a half? Is it two years? Um, And for, I would say, the first, most of that time, they were very present here. And honestly, and I don't want to call out anyone's ages and stuff like that, but you could tell he's a little bit older than me. And honestly, it's tough to, to develop new habits in life and to, and to lean into new spaces in life. But it has been such a joy to see Dennis and Donna just be like, you know what, now is the time for us to step into a community group. 
And for us to step into a place of relationship and to have conversations we're not used to having and to be able, for Donna to be able to say, you know what, um, in fact, I want to host the next one at my house while Ming and Tony are away and I actually want to learn how to study the Bible, right? That old adage of like, uh, wait a minute, I don't know if I want to say, uh, you know how people say old dogs, new tricks? I don't mean to, the reason I, old dog, I don't want to use that word, but, but once you get set in your ways, it's very difficult to, to start something new. And what I see in this family is them saying, you know what? It's time for us to take steps to adopt this mindset and to move in that direction. And there are others I can make mention of as well. But I think that the key is what this parable is calling us to and what this core virtue for our church is calling us to to hold health and growth together is to say, let's surface what we really believe about God, what we really believe about Christ. I might even cross out the word believe, what we really assume about Christ. Is it like the servants, the first two servants, or is it that third one? Is it that we just think that we have a God who asks hard things of us, period, the end? Or can we open up our minds and step into this multiplication mindset to say, he does ask hard things, but he also gives many things, and he gives us people to be able to walk forward with those hard things. To surface our scarcity assumptions and replace them with multiplying assumptions and practices. Let me close with this before I turn the mic over to you guys. These would be two multiplying assumptions that I think we have or need that I wonder sometimes if we assume the opposite. Number one is, I've said this before already, God cares for what we care about better than we will care about it. God cares for what we care about better than we will care about it, better than we would care about it, and frankly, let me put it in the present, better than we do care about it. And I don't know that there's anything more uh, uh, descriptive of faith than that for us here in the West, in the New York, New Jersey area, that God cares about our stuff more than we care about our stuff because it's his stuff. He knows its origins. He knows its intents. He knows its upsides. And then the second thing, which I think is probably just as important for adopting this mindset and abandoning this one, is that God does not condemn our errors. He is not sitting there waiting with the red pen to bloody up your paper and then hands it back to you. I'll take this back when you've made revisions and I get my hundred. God does not condemn errors. He invites us to be a people who experiences, uh, yes, the pain, but also the gain together. I told my daughters, um, specifically I remember having this conversation with Hannah. She would, there is no one who practices better than Hannah. She looks like a textbook and she's like, you know, a video that you'd want to send people for how to like train as an athlete, but she would have this block that she would run into on competition day, specifically after she broke her leg, right? right? After she experiences pain. Um, and she would always wind up like running way too conservatively, right? And she would start to take little gains, but it was orienting her towards a much more pessimistic view of herself and her gifts. And so I just started to say, hey, you know what? We've already made this one mistake 10 times. Let's just start to make new mistakes. Right? Not let's fix it. Let's try hard and, and let's be willing to make new mistakes, to fall forward. And in that, in many ways, is what this mindset is calling us to. Before I go to the table, uh, I want to give the mic to you guys for you guys to flesh this out a little bit with uh, your reflections, responses, questions, what have you. So. Michael's got the mic, Evelyn's got a hand right here, and so does um, Alyssa. Okay, so these are comments and thoughts as you spoke. Number one, I thought um, God did see the person. With, first, I thought, why one, why did he, how did he know that some required five talents, 
down mm -hmm. to one. And he knew that the one, he gave the one one for his ability. And then I thought, um, you know, like, sometimes we're afraid. We're afraid to take that step. Mm -hmm. And there goes that step of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to do it afraid. Yeah. And we find that when we do things afraid, it, it's okay, it's good. We learn from it. Or if we fail, as you said, like mm -hmm. God is a God of grace, mm -hmm. and we just get up and do it again. Um, yeah. It's not always that easy, right? But you have to take that step of faith. And in my own life, from when I was a little girl, I had, well, when I first came to the Lord, I was like 17. The pastor said, Evelyn, you're shy. And I hated that mm. he gave me that, that label. You call it that label. Yeah. And um, I didn't like it because mm -hmm. I was a quiet person and I might be an introvert. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but through life I learned and I learned to take that step of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I took care of um, kids in Sunday school, they were the little ones. And then suddenly I go to a church and I say, yeah, I'll volunteer. And then I'm taking care of like fifth graders with a little attitude. I'm like, oh, my mm. God, I have to do this. And you know what? From there, I learned and I took that to work. Mm. And I was able to speak before people and I, there was growth. Amen. So, yeah, don't be afraid to take and that's that the step th of faith. That's the thing about, um, here's another question. That's the thing about multiplying is like it's not a linear path. It sometimes just looks like steady, steady, steady. And then, you know, I always call it the Sudoku effect. That Sudoku effect happens. You know when you play the game of Sudoku, it's like you're stalling. You don't know which number. And then you find three numbers, and now all of a sudden the whole board comes together. And in, in many ways, that's what, that's what the multiplication mindset is. It's like you're pushing, 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 believing that the world, because of Jesus and the Spirit, is oriented in that direction. Um, rather than, we are a new covenant people, rather than an old covenant one. Um, so God doesn't trust us with that one, the one. <laughs> he trusts us that we will, and if mm -hmm. he knows that we can do it. Yes, amen. Well, you know what's funny about fear? She said something about fear, and I'm going to pause um, until I hear all the questions, because I want to lead us to the table with this, but thank you for prompting us with that. Go ahead, Liz. Hey, so the graph reminds me of a sine-cosine graph, going <laughs> yeah. up and down, so yeah. then... At what point, I guess, relating to God in this church, is like growth damaging for us? Mm -hmm. Is growth damaging? Yeah, it can yeah. be. That's, yeah, that's, that's, um, when there's a growth that has left behind health, um, which is why I say tension. Because I could ask the opposite question too, right? When, when is a focus on, and you might say, well, this would never happen because you're focused on health. But sometimes the way a peop, people apply a focus on health is to make sure we just stay small and conservative. I don't mean conservative from a view standpoint, but small and safe and risk averse. Because if we do that, we'll make sure everyone's healthy. And actually, no, you'll actually just cave in on yourselves. And so similarly, on the other side, focusing on growth, 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 um, and, and by the way, I, when I say growth, I do not mean this. Um, focusing on growth, 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 like, yeah, if you leave behind the other side of the tension, then it is, it is absolutely dangerous because it's unsustainable. You know, Vanita said something to me a while back. Um, a pastor was praying for like the doors of his church to be open and to be flooded with people. And I think there's a really wise question that it was met with, which is, okay, you have all these people, what are you gonna do with them? How are you gonna care for them? And so I think like uh, if you just focused on growth, then you, know, you send out your mailers and you do all the, you know, the gimmicky attractional events that get people in your doors, but you don't really have the other side of the tension, health in mind, what are you gonna do with them once you get them? then yeah, it becomes, growth becomes one of the most dangerous things in the world. Um, you wind up not being a trader, you wind up being a gambler. Um, and I think that's the difference, even though a lot of people think Wall Street traders are gamblers. I'm not bitter about that. Raj and then uh, Curtis. Yep. Well, so essentially, the servants know that they were given talents based on their ability. Mm -hmm. Based on their ability, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I'm curious about that. Yeah. But essentially, the, five, the person with the two talents got the same return as the one with the five. Like 100% return for the servants. 
Mm -hmm. So is that kind of saying that although you have this level of ability, he has the same math level as a five. Mm -hmm. So he grew into that ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have the potential to grow. Mm -hmm. So you just have that mindset like that. I guess this passage kind of encourages that even though you're here, you're yeah. patient. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And I think it, it um, synthesizes well with... Mike, can you check that mic? It synthesizes well with... Uh, there you go. You just had to hit it hard enough, I suppose. It synthesizes well with uh, to whom much is given, much is required. Um, I think it would have been a uh, wicked and slothful servant. I gave you five. You only made two. Um, and let's like, get away from the numbers a little bit. What it's getting at is, remember, this is Israelite shape. And so there are some tribes in the, in the, in the story of Israel that were given far more than some of the other tribes. And God wasn't calling half tribes to be like Judah or, you know, Reuben or the Levites, right? They had certain roles and they had certain callings. Um, and the idea was to lean on the Lord and all that he had supplied to make the most of that calling. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, to whom much is given, much is required applies here. There's something else I was gonna say, but it leaked out of my brain. Hi. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you said that God does not condemn our errors and you said he's not like taking a sheet and marking it in red and then mm -hmm. giving us giving it back to us and saying we need to make improvements on something. In order I feel to like that. I'm being set up right now. No, no, no. But you also <laughs> said that you need to make new mistakes. Yeah. And in, when you're making new mistakes, you're trying to get to a goal of improvement. Yeah. So I feel like in that way, isn't it kind of getting the red mark of revisions and then receiving feedback? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. It's, it's yeah, I guess that places it within the context of the community, right? Like I tried and you know, I fell, and now there's loving people around me, people who lead me, people who walk alongside of me, that help pick me up and maybe say, hey, you tried this, that was great. Uh, I think these five things you did worked. Th these one or two things you did probably didn't work as well. Maybe we could do it a different way. And then it becomes up to that servant, I guess, to incorporate that and then to grow from that. So that's a really good push, Bethany, I appreciate that. But if, and this is what I tell my students, if you don't make that first effort, I have nothing to give you feedback on. If you don't put clay on the table, we can't strip it, add and take away. So, Curtis. Um, j just some th thoughts on the, you, you mentioned the dynamic of people who want to, to open up the doors and, and fill the church and then what would we do with them? Yeah. And, and I think that can definitely be done in a, in a toxic way, mm -hmm. in an unhealthy way. But then um, I, I want to just, I, I want to I wanna put it out there that there is the reaction that is equally toxic. Yeah. That we cannot open our doors yet because we don't have all of our small groups set. We cannot open our doors yet because we don't have our pastoral care systems all set. Mm -hmm. We cannot open our doors yet because we don't have the two full-time, you know, pastors and the uh, you know, part-time yeah. associate. Like, we can't do that because X, Y, Z. And, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that mentality yeah. both with Christian and then with business logic because most of my experience is in the tech startup world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the Christian world, we're fundamentally missing that if we believe that Christ grows the church, that Christ will also bring resources in those, in those phases of growth to help care for that growth. And that's, it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big faith. It's a big trust. But if, if God is the one who is regenerating mm. souls, that is bringing people to him, God is also the one that is equipping the church and preparing it to care for them. In, in the business world, if any of you all have seen this, in the, you, know, you see that so much people try to perfect a product before, mm. before you know, they want yeah. to get it so right, and they never are able to capture market share, and those yep. are the companies that, that, that die. And, and yep. so... Um, you know, we can see this practically, but um, you know, I, I think it's beautiful that in, in, in Jesus, we, we, actually have, we actually have reason to believe. It's not just blind trust like we might have yes. in, in the business world. We have reason to believe that something is equipping us. Amen. Um, 
I've heard it in the startup world as well, where you have to realize that all of life, you're always in beta test mode. That you're never going, that means like you're never, ever, ever going to get to like the product being perfect. It's always in, in some ways, demo. Um, you know, in the education world, they always talk about, we're always building the plane while we're flying it. And I'm like, that sounds dangerous. Um, but there is a reality to that as well, that you can't, you're not going to hit the perfect uh, stopping point before you start. Matt. This will be the, oh, okay. We got, I can't say no to you, so it'll be Matt and then Vanita. It's right. It's right. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks. I just want to clarify. What does fruitful mean? Does it mean people? Do you mean uh, quantitatively? Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't mean less than that. That's a good question. I think it is quantitative and uh, qualitative growth. And so if we think about it within Israel's story. Um, so again, Israel whittled down in the mission it was given quantitatively and qualitatively. In other words, they did not fulfill the mission to be a light to the Gentiles. And so the nations didn't come pouring forth, uh, attracted to um, the God of Israel because of the people of Israel. In fact, the nations occupied them, right? And so their, Israel became smaller and they became less influential. I think... Um, on this side, when you read the New Testament, you do have the promise and then in the fulfillment that not only will the gospel go to the ends of the earth and we start to see that, we start to see the reversal of the Tower of Babel happening at Pentecost and Antioch and all these places where now tongues are bringing in the four corners of the earth, but we're also seeing descendants uh, uh, of Abraham and followers of Jesus that are innumerable more than you know the the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky and so we i don't think i have the liberty to say because of our discomfort with size that oh it's just qualitative i think there is a qualitative dimension in terms of crossing cultures and extending across people groups and i think there is a quantitative dimension as well of of growth in terms of more people so i think both of those exist question is real, is real brief. Um, going back to the one talent, and the, the man said that he was afraid. He said, I ma master, I knew you to be a hard man. Mm -hmm. So my question here is that, did the person not know who God was and have formed an opinion of him versus really seeing that God is is so big mm -hmm. and do we do that do yeah. we make these decisions of, of um, not growing because we are afraid because we don't know God we don't know God we don't trust God um, we think this is all on us um, I, I, like, I, like I said I used to say that this servant didn't know the master at all and I'm like mm, I think he knew something about the master but left out a lot I think he had um, an impoverished understanding of his master, right? Israel throughout the Old Testament has a knowledge of Yahweh. However, over time, it's increasingly incomplete and distorted. And so I think some ways we have a true knowledge of God, even in our scarcity mindset, but we've left out a lot. And we've thought, oh, God gave us enough grace to get us here. Like we're all here. Wherever you've been in your life, you've made it here. God gave us enough grace to get us here, and now he turns the spigot off. And I think we can all develop that. That's where our scarcity kicks in, and that's where our multiplication needs to kick in. Well, I want to lead us to the table right now um, in an ominous kind of a way, because if you look at verse 30 and how it ultimately leaves us with the, the servant, what does the master do? He casts the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. Um, exile is the way you should think about this if we're keeping the Israelite story. Um, why? Why does it end here? It could have gone in a more hopeful direction. Why does it end in this? And I think it's a couple of reasons. Um, number one, remember 
the servant language here. Israel was always meant to be the servant, uh, the servant of the Lord that has a very specific identity and function, which is you're going to be the conduit for recovering what humanity is supposed to look like, and you're going to be the vessel through which uh, the nations of the world come back to the true knowledge of God. And so for Israel to just take what God has given them and bury it in the ground and not risk, take calculated risks to multiply it, they are not only injuring themselves, they are robbing from the people that they were called to reach. And then the other part of it is, there is this idea of the true servant, the true faithful Israelite, which is Jesus himself. And if you want to put the gospel in the language of scarcity and multiplication, um, their scarcity, the institutions and the governments of Jesus' day, their scarcity, wanting to hold on to the little that they had, their scarcity killed Jesus. But his multiplication saves us. Their scarcity mindset put him to death, but his multiplication mindset, being the true, faithful, uh, good and faithful servant is the one that saves us. So as you come to this table with health and growth in mind, See this as a table of health and growth. Jesus heals us by taking on our scarcity-driven hearts and minds, like the Pharisees, like the Romans of his day. He takes that from us and gives us to grow us his resurrection power for multiplication. And so as you come to this table, come with our scarcities, wherever they lie, in mind. Take the bread. When you hear this body is broken from you, this body is broken for you to break your scarcity mindset. This cup, take this cup so that you may drink in the resurrection power of his multiplication. First and foremost, this table is meant for those who identify as followers of Jesus. Um, however, if you are in a place where you're like, I'm tired of living this scarcity mindset. I'm tired of, of saying that this is all up to me. Not only does it stress me out, it robs me of who I'm supposed to be. And it is now I understand that it's actually robbing God of all that is also his. This table is also meant for you to be the place where you finally identify with Jesus uh, for the first time. And so come when you're ready, wherever you stand, to the table of both health and growth. Let me pray. Father, um, would you lead us? Would you lead us and guide us towards you, uh, to the mind and heart that you want to give to your people, that you want to give to this church? Help us to be a place of health. Help us to be a place of growth for your glory, uh, for our joy, and for the flourishing of our community and those that you've sent us to. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on.